Learning to tell what's real from what's not by understanding the science, developing a basic science literacy, a basic critical thinking literacy, uh, and to better understand our world, better make better decisions about our lives, and have fun doing it with cool stories. So that's what this film is about. The thing I'm most proud of in this film, as you'll notice at the very end of the end credits, so don't walk out like people do in movies, <laughs> in the middle of the credits. The thing I'm most proud about is that it's being released free to the world. It's non-commercial, it's non-profit. We do not make any money from any screenings. There is no business model behind it. It had to be completely crowdfunded by people who are on board with our mission. That's why the company Skeptoid Media <laughs> That's why it's a nonprofit. It became a nonprofit in 2012 to provide free educational resources like this to anyone in the, everyone in the world who wants them. So the people who funded this film are simply on board with that. They're not investors, they're not getting paid back. Everyone who worked on this is either a, a paid professional who's very good, is the best people we were able to afford and, and to bring in on the project, or are people like myself who are doing it just for the love of the work and because we think it's the right thing to do. So with that in mind, please enjoy Principles of Thank Curiosity. Thank you for it. It's something that's amazing, especially in this uh, day and age. It was it was great, uh, though, Brian, if you want to help with how to draw, like on the screen with markers and make it like look real good, uh, I'm, I'm your man. Now you know who I study. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so uh, that was amazing. Thank you all for coming and supporting this uh, non-profit film, which is another awesome thing. I'm Kyle Hill. I talk about science on TV and the internet, and I actually have a connection to Brian. I'm not just here. I started out my career in science communication via skepticism and organized skepticism. I started listening to podcasts like Skeptoid, and I became involved in the movement, and I, uh, I, I changed my path, and now we kind of run in parallel circles, and it's, it's great to be here uh, with Brian again. It's been about five years, I think, since my first TAM when I was a kid. Woohoo! <laughs> I have really, really short hair back then, too. Um, also, if you have any questions uh, during this Q&A, we'll also have time for your Q&A. So if you have any burning questions uh, for Brian or Ryan, hold them in your mind, and we'll get to them uh, after a few minutes of me questioning them. Um, but without further ado, let's bring them out. Uh, director Ryan C. Johnson and writer Brian Dunning. besides the United States, have always been telling me, hey, I use your podcasts in, in my classroom. And here's, here's a copy of some educational materials that I made to go along with it. Um, and it became clear that this is what teachers wanted. And so I wanted to give something that every teacher would be able to get a hold of, that they didn't have to pay for, because my wife being a teacher, many of you being teachers, Teachers have to pay for a lot of stuff out of their own pocket. They get very little resources from their school in many cases. And I didn't want there to be any barriers to entry. We had the ability to do this because I kind of had a, forgive me, a captive audience from the podcast. So I had a, a, some people who I thought would be willing to fund it. And um, the whole idea was to give something to them that, would, uh, that they'd be able to use. That's great. I think, I think it's very honorable. As, as a director, though, what does, does that change the way that you film this, that you present this in any way? 
because <laughs> well, well, I, I think what I'm getting at is you struck a very, especially in your tone, the way you communicated on screen, it struck, it struck a really, uh, I think, great balance between entertainment and something that would be, that, that, is, that is very understandable to kids. It, it felt like an educational video without it feeling like an educational video. How did you strike that balance? Well, the goal from the beginning was to always make sure that this is something that always maintains your interest. And for, a, you know, our goal was 40 minutes. I think we're 40 minutes in like, what, four seconds or something like that? One second? So I went over, I'm sorry. That's because his logo at the end. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, striking that balance is always difficult, especially, you know, in the beginning stages of this, we talked a lot about some of these concepts were really tricky to try to figure out how do you visualize you know Occam's razor how do you visualize you know taking all of these concepts and making that something that is is appealing to look at and in doing that you know a lot of it comes you just kind of push forward and you keep working through the issues and it kind of takes on a life of its own and you know a big part of this and we haven't had a chance to say it, but there's a huge group of people out there that were also a big part of making this happen. And if I could, for a moment, I'd love to take a second Absolutely. to thank them. If you were at all involved in this project, in the production of it, would you guys stand up for a second so I could see you? There's a few of you there. I couldn't have done it without you, Andrew, my wife, and Brian's wife. We uh, essentially were single parents for a couple months while we did this, more than a few. Anyway, um, you have great friends, you have great production partners, and you talk a lot about it, and you kind of spitball ideas back and forth. Brian has fantastic ideas, and the reason why I became friends with him so long ago is because he has a tremendous ability to take a very big, kind of esoteric concept and distill it down. Any of you who listen to his podcast know that he can take a pretty big idea and bring it down into a very manageable, bite-sized podcast that's very enjoyable to listen to. And, uh, you know, we just kept doing that over and over and over here in this video. Well, you do have a pretty rad voice, too. I like listening yeah. to it. It's like, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like butter in a pair of Keens. <laughs> you wear a lot of Keens. Sorry to you So, if I, if I can answer uh, the, the question you asked him about um, uh, directing and how to, how to get... Yeah, where's the, the, where's the balance? On. Okay, well, I do an audio podcast, and there's no pictures of an audio podcast. <laughs> and I'm very accustomed to writing something without having to worry about what pictures might go with it. And so our very first production meeting was like, okay, this is a fine script. What do we put on screen? And I don't know. That's your job, man. Think you're so good. So really, the, the biggest question we had in coming up with this was, okay, what's the main example that we're going to use? Obviously, you know, it's the Death Valley, the, the moving rocks. Because that's like the, the kind of the visual cornerstone that we could make an actual visual movie around. And... I don't want to get too far afield from your question, but this is an interesting point. Filming inside a national park is not a given by any shot. It, it was, a, it was a, a shot in the dark whether we were going to get a, a film permit granted. Especially before they become Mad Max Thunderdomes. <laughs> and that's, that's actually closer to the truth than you know also, because they had vandalism problems at the racetrack with people driving their trucks around, not with dead bodies strapped to the hood, as far as I know. But that impacted our ability to get the film permit, too. So we actually almost had no visual cornerstone around which to make a movie out of this. I, I, I really appreciated the example that you did focus on, the Sailing Stones, because I noticed, and this was probably a conscious choice, and something like it wasn't, that it was probably going to be more beneficial for the film in terms of spreading it if it didn't tackle a very controversial claim as its main focus. If you took on, for example, hey, this is why acupuncture doesn't work or doesn't work in the way people say it does, it might immediately turn off a large portion of the audience. Was that a conscious decision? That's very astute. That was a huge part of the decision because when we're choosing, okay, what's our main example, it couldn't be something that was going to hit people in the face, that it was going to turn a lot of people off right from the get-go. It had to be something that's not controversial. Now, let me tell you about the history of Jesus. 
<laughs> that would have been a little intense. Yeah. So it couldn't be something that was especially controversial today. It also had to be something for which there was a science-based explanation. Something that there's a, a real mystery that actually has had people confused and wondering for a time, but that there was a real science-based explanation that had been arrived at through science-based means. So when you look at all of the other possible mysteries we could have used, the list gets pretty short, pretty fast. And I was going through all 500 episodes of my podcast, going through the history, looking, gee, can we use this? No, it's, it's, it's controversial. Or yeah, the sandstone stones are fairly innocuous. There's not an entire, you know, like a tourism community built up around it, like Loch Ness, where it'd be, well, you're messing, you're messing with something I've been, I've been hearing about for years. It was kind of like that neutral ground. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, let's look into that. And we weren't worried about conspiracy theorists saying, no, it was aliens moving the stones and shooting out. <laughs> Those are too heavy for humans. Yeah, that, that would be weird. Uh, I want, I want Ryan to take the, take this next question because I'm pretty sure I know what your answer is. But working on a film like this for so long and as a labor of love, I want to know. I, I, I have an idea of what you want this film to do for people. But what is a, a making critical thinking really a part of your life? How has that changed your life? In wow. Um, well, you know when I first kind of got into the movie business, I wanted to make rock videos. So, I just did this one and it's on rocks, but uh, <laughs> that was for you. Uh, don't encourage that. Don't encourage that kind of joke. That was um, you know, I didn't know that I was a quote-unquote skeptic until I started getting exposed to media where people started calling themselves skeptics and critical thinkers and all this kind of stuff. My dad's an engineer, my mom's an artist. I kind of got a great combination of the two, and that's always been something I've been interested in but didn't really know how to apply it. And as I started learning about this whole community of like-minded individuals that are really pro-science, pro-critical thinking, and you know, take a look at everything, maybe a little extra, uh, with extra scrutiny, it it allowed me to find great common ground with a person like Brian, and you know, just go into. We we we've tried a lot of projects together. Some have been successful, and some have not. And this project was a great opportunity. And when he asked me, "Hey, do you want to direct this?" I was like, "Absolutely, of course." Everything that I do in my life is all about entertaining or educating people, and I really love having that ability. Did I answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> no, but that kind of that leads into, into a, a personal-ish question uh, for Brian. You know, I, like I said, you know, I started out in my, you remember, you remember when, when I showed up at TAM. Look at the cute little nerd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when I showed up at TAM in like 2011, 2012 or something like that, and I was big into organized skepticism, as you say, these like-minded individuals, and uh, through, through the years, for specific reasons and not so specific reasons, I decided to more or less get out of the game and do a more general science communication approach. There's been a lot of turmoil in the skeptic community, especially recently, but something like this, I think, works. Do you think this is what modern skepticism can be? Or do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I, Because I, I know there's yeah. a lot of people affiliated with, with the movement, with organizations in the crowd. There are a lot of people in the, in the skeptic movement who consider themselves to be part of the skeptic movement, and there's a lot of people who say, I got out of organized skepticism, and it almost, yeah, it, it almost comes down to like an identity politics thing. And having always been independent, which is a great benefit of being nonprofit and being by myself, is I've never cared about any of that. Uh, and I really, I don't label myself as part of any movement. Um, I have most of my friends and uh, closest business associates, people that I work with, um, certainly are part of the the organized skeptic movement, a lot of whom are here tonight. Hello. Hello. <laughs> There's one. Um, but I, I, took, I took from that, because that was sort of my, my introduction, as was yours, into science communication. Yeah. I took from that what I thought was going to be really important and decided to build a nonprofit around that. And the specific seed that I took that I decided I would focus on and make the, the core of my work 
would be helping people to learn what's real from what's not. Um, I don't, I'm not part of any of the other movements, quote unquote, that take any particular one of those answers to some extreme and focus on that. I don't care. I just want people to have the tools to make those decisions and do with what, do with them what they will. Well, I think I think you're still yeah. great. Uh, 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 could become one of those uh, fun, one of those fundamental stepping stones that you give. Some, hey, check this out. If you're interested, you know, you're wondering how to figure figure out fact and fiction. Check this out. I know that I would recommend it. So with that, um, if there's any questions. Uh, please raise your hand and speak loudly, and I'll repeat your question um, for either of our fine gentlemen here, and uh, we can give you a few minutes to answer. So, oh, right there. Yes, you sir. Yes. Well, I said you didn't want to hit people with something that would be controversial. Part of the argument here is. Um, we landed on the moon, we don't have to do stuff. It's my understanding that you know, a large percentage of teenagers these days have taken a step back that we didn't. Did you consider going down that slippery slope, or what was your thoughts about that? I'm trying to prove that. Yeah, I guess, is it is it difficult to set up your argument with other arguments that might not be considered fact, like the moon landing? Well, I mean, you notice I slipped a lot of things in there, like, you know, Detoxing is bullshit. Can I say for <laughs> Yeah, this is HBO. You know, there was there was a dozen little things like that slipped slipped in throughout the film. Are you speaking particular, particularly about the moon landing? Did we try and go after the moon landing hoax? Um, uh, what if, is it is it difficult to build an argument upon that when there is a large percentage of people who don't agree with that statement? Using it as an example is difficult in that regard. I think is the argument. You know the. There's one. There's two schools of thought. You can, you can go the. I'm not. I'm not. Don't take this as criticism of Michael Moore, but you can go the Michael Moore route and specifically make a film about something that you know is going to divide people in half and use that as the marketing. Um, or you can. That's where I go. I, I I don't go that way. I don't. I did not set off. Set out to to. To create any controversies with this, I wanted, I wanted, but, but there are a lot of controversial topics that I mentioned. These things that I said I slipped in, um, I do slip in a, a bunch of things like that, and I could easily make a documentary about each one of those. But it would be tough. It would be tough to do that, kind of in the, in the, in, in the educational realm that I'm going for, because. I don't see a lot of teachers wanting to put that in front of their students. If I were to make a film specifically about any one of the most controversial topics in here, 50% of the teachers would never use the film. And that's why I stay away from the most important topic. I think, I think maybe what I, what I think you're getting at as well is that if we're going to do an educational film, we have to start somewhere. And if anything, the fact that we put people on the moon is a decent place to start. Like, sorry, we have to start there. This happened. Let's move on. So, I, I, yeah, I, I, see, I see why that would be hard, because you have to at least start with a known quantity and then move forward from there, even though people might not think about that as a known quantity. And, and one thing that, that, another theme that I often mention is you've got to start with common ground. You can get anyone to come around to almost any point of view if you do it starting from the point of common ground. Um, when we can all agree on a particular story, like okay, Sailing Stones, that's not going to create any controversy or take anyone off. But we can all agree, oh, it's interesting to know why the stones move, and here's how we know that, and here's all the, all the, all the little components of the scientific method. And we can all agree that that's all pretty cool, and that, that machine works pretty well. And when you can get people on board with that, then it makes it much easier to get them to start applying that same machine to the subjects that they might otherwise not be willing to have that conversation about. The thing, their sacred cows that are important to them. Uh, I saw right there, uh, you're on the front, yes? Uh, yeah, um, what was your time frame from conception to actual uh, final production of the film? So what was the time frame of the film from conception? What did you think? You started writing this in 2009? 2006. 2006. <laughs> um, 
I, I started putting notes together on this in 2014. And then we had our first production meeting, I believe it was last November. Yeah, we had a production meeting in November, and then we pretty much started going really hard on this starting December, and we shot through January, February, March. Uh, pretty intense production of it, um, including the amazing score by Lee Sanders. It was all done within a month, and uh, it was amazing. Yeah, back to the back there. Get off into all the politics of the stuff, but stand up for a second because this is not being possible. Absolutely amazing score. And time for a few That's more. Uh, way in the back. Uh, so I know you said a lot about educational stuff. Do you have any plans to implement this into the educational curriculum? Do you have any plans to implement this? So, yes. Um, so right now, if anyone wants to go to the website, Principles of Curiosity, about 25 pages long. Uh, we had a team of people working on that during these last couple of months while the film was in post-production. It is an absolutely brilliant document, I think. It's wonderful. It's got materials for high school through college, uh, any number of different college programs. Uh, and that's now, now that we've had this premiere, that's one of the things I'm going to be promoting most aggressively to uh, the, the instructor, the educators that are on my mailing list. Um, then we've also got, the, the film's budget was low, but even it had to be spread pretty thin, and most of it, a lot of it couldn't go just to the film. Part of what the budget's going to is a marketing program to educators. So we've got somebody contracted for the next four months into the fall semester who's going to be basically just pounding the education markets to get this make awareness of this of this resource available to as many teachers as we can. That's awesome. I, let's let's take, uh, let's take, we have a couple more, um, right in the middle, right there. Me, sir? Yes, you, sir. Uh, Brian, how do we spread this uh, video around? What is the best way to like, share, subscribe? Ah. Magically, while you were all watching the film, I was sitting up there in back changing the YouTube page from unlisted to public. Woo! Just share it, you post it, retweet it, put it on Facebook, share it all over the place. You have no trouble finding it. Uh, um, just search YouTube for Principles of Curiosity. You'll find it right away. And Fantastic. Soon enough, that link will be on some other websites. Thank you. I think we had two more. Uh, there's, there's, I'll get to you last. Uh, there's one right in the middle back there. Brian, you've got 10 years of uh, podcast material. Uh, you made quite a challenge limiting yourself to 40 minutes. Is there anything in the film that you just go, you really wish you had a little more time to give it a more nuanced view than what you could do in the uh, time frame of the movie? Uh, no, I, I was actually pretty happy with, um, with uh, the, the time given to, to each of the subjects. Um, you know, I'm making, making a subject fit into a specified short time frame is what I do for a living. So having 40 minutes was you know, an embarrassment of space for me. <laughs> uh, an embarrassment of riches, as it were. So I had, I had no trouble with that. I, I was pretty happy with it. Great. And, uh, last question? Yeah? Yeah, you guys went all over the desert, but I was wondering, why didn't you go to the Bahamas? <laughs> why didn't you go to a nice location? We tried to fund the film with a music festival in the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> What's, yeah. what's your first drink? What's the first thing? <laughs> Most often. You know it's Wikipedia. Google Scholar? I, I'll, I'll, I'll try, well, okay. I'm going to try to give, instead of a, there, there, it's, it's really hard to answer that question. Where do I go for good information? But I will give one piece of advice that I think is relevant. And especially during the current political climate, I think this is more important than ever, is to seek out the information you disagree with as eagerly as you seek out the information you agree with. So when you go to one favorite news source, I suggest you also go to an opposing news source and see what they say on the same topic, and you'll probably get a better idea of the overall picture. Um, I do that with all of my podcast episodes. And I think it's a great way to uh, to learn the nuances of any subject. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I know we don't this game. Uh, everyone, please, big round of applause. Share the educational material, share the video itself, and uh, maybe it'll just be that little bit more of a push uh, than would be otherwise for good information in the world. So thank you all so much for coming. I think there's something a little bit after as well. Yes, great. And, uh, and uh, be responsible and drive home safe afterwards. Thank you so much.